Welcome back, Chemistry 30. So we looked at the notation here to indicate a polar molecule, whether we use the partial delta symbols here or the arrow pointing to the direction of electron shifting with the positive left as the positive um, ion. Uh, so here the cross end of the arrow, so we talked about that. Polarity helps determine many properties we observe at the macroscopic level in the laboratory and in everyday life. Polar molecules tend to align themselves with respect to one another, with the negative end of one molecule and the positive end of another attracting each other. Polar molecules are likewise attracted to ions. So if we look over here, um, if we look at how water molecules dissolve salt, so salt is made up of sodium ions and chloride ions in close proximity to one another, and a water molecule H2O, two H's, O. Of course, O is more electronegative than H, so the oxygen side is slightly negative, leaving the H's as slightly positive, and you can see how this works. So the positive H, a teenage moment there, <laughs> pulls the negative chlorine away and surrounds it, and the negative part of the oxygen in the water molecule pulls the positive sodium apart, surrounds it, and that is the process of dissolving. So water molecules are polar, sodium chloride is ionic, so it works out really well. The force between the hydrogen and the chloride, chlorine and the um, negative oxygen part of the water and the positive sodium is greater than the force holding the sodium chloride together, so we can see it, it pulls it apart like that. All right, uh, next. So we have that. These interactions account for many of the properties of liquid, solids, and solutions that you, you can see. Uh, how can we quantify the polar molecule? Whenever two electrical charges of equal magnitude but opposite sign are separated, sometimes we refer to that as a dipole. And we'll be looking at that later on. So polar molecules, they have dipole set up, two charges separated at distance, that's what a, a dipole is referred to as. Okay, we are going to skip the next two pages. We're not going to worry about those calculations, which leads us to the last page here for this section, differentiating between ionic and covalent bonding. So to understand the interactions responsible for chemical bonding, it is adv advantageous to treat ionic and covalent bonding as separate. That is the approach taken in this chapter, as well as, as in other undergraduate chemistry texts. In reality, however, there is a continuum between the extremes of ionic and covalent bonding. This lack of well-defined separation between the two types of bonding may seem unsettling and confusing at first. So even back here, we've used the general idea that metals and nonmetals are ionic, metals or, and nonmetals and nonmetals are, are covalent, but it, it's not quite that clear-cut at times. And even here, looking at electronegativity values, I mentioned, okay, this is around 3, so it's ionic, because that's a pretty big number. Whereas here, 1.9, that's quite a bit less than here, so it's polar covalent, and then this is for sure is non-covalent. So there isn't an exact separation, as we'll see, but there's kind of range of values. Um, uh, this is a lack of well-defined, so, so it seems confusing at first. The simple models of ionic and covalent bonding presented in this chapter go a long way to, to understanding and predicting the structures or properties of chemical compounds. When co covalent bonding is dominant, more often than not we expect compounds to exist as molecules, sharing electrons, having all the properties we asso associate with molecular substances, such as relatively low melting and boiling points. Make sure you highlight that, gang and non-electrolyte behavior when they are dissolved in water. Non-electrolyte behavior means uh, chances are it's not going to um, conduct a solution. So for example here, uh, if we look at this picture here, um, ethanol for example would be an example of a covalent bonded molecule or a molecule and we can see it doesn't carry the charge. So if I had oppositely charged plates in, in water don't do this at home, folks, it, it wouldn't conduct the solution. Whereas if I have k potassium chloride, um, potassium chloride, of course, exists as positive potassiums, negative chlorides. So in, in a solution, that would, of course, as we just saw, water molecules would rip it apart. We have ions floating around, positive and negative ions, and that would, in effect, uh, close the circuit and cause a light bulb to light up. So that would be 
conductive versus non-conductive. All right, uh, and that's what we refer to as um, electrolyte or non-electrolyte behavior. Um, when ionic bonding is dominant, we expect the compounds to be very brittle, have high melting solids with extended lattice structures, and exhibiting strong electrolyte behavior because they can get dissolved in water and complete that circuit. There are, of course, exceptions to these general characterizations, some of which we examine later. Uh, nonetheless, the ability to quickly cater categorize the predominant bonding interactions in a substance as covalent or ionic imparts considerable insight into the properties of that substance. The question then becomes the best way in which we can do this, which one dominates. The simplest approach is to assume that the interactions between a metal and a non-metal is likely going to be ionic. And the interaction between non-metals is covalent, as we've talked about. And you've talked about that all the way back from grade 10. Though this classification scheme is reasonable predictive, there are quite a few exceptions that we could l have than rather to use it blindly. For, bl blindly. for example, tin is a metal and chlorine is a non-metal, so we'd expect that to be ionic, but it is molecular. It exists as a colorless liquid at room temperature, freezes at negative 33 and boils at 114. And those are both considered low boiling and low melting points compared to like sodium chloride which is in the thousands. Clearly this substance does not have characteristics of an ionic substance. A more sophisticated approach is to use the difference in electronegativity as the main criterion for determining whether ionic or covalent bonding will be dominant. This uh, approach correctly predicts the bonding between tin and chlorine to be polar covalent based on the electronegativity difference of 1.2 only as opposed to um, three with this ionic solid. So tin and chlorine, if we can take just take a quick look at that. So chlorine is over here, 3.0. Tin is over here at 1.8. So you can see it's a metal that's on the fringe of the staircase there. So you can see it's relatively closer, 1.2, compared to the metals over here, which would have a huge electronegativity difference. All right. Uh, so if we go back to there, so it's primarily covalent because of that small electronegativity difference. Evalu evaluating bonding based on electronegative, electronegativity difference is a useful system, but again, it has a shortcoming. Uh, the electronegativity values given in that figure do not take into account changes in bonding that accompany changes in the oxidation state of a metal. So, for example, iron 2 versus iron 3, or tin 2 versus tin 4 because remember those transition elements can have more than one um, positive charge. So for example, in figure uh, 8.7 gives electronegativity difference between uh, manganese and oxygen. Uh, so we have different, so we have uh, a difference of that too, which falls in the range where the bonding is normally considered ionic because it's a fairly large number. And if we look at something that we know with for sure is ionic, such as sodium chloride, we, the difference there is 2.1. Therefore, it's not surprising to learn that uh, manganese 2 oxide is a green solid that melts at 1842 degrees C. So that's extremely high and it's similar to sodium chloride. However, the bonding between the manganese and oxygen is not always ionic. For example, manganese 7 oxide, which we see as Mn2O7, Manganese has a charge of plus 7 with that one compared to uh, the manganese oxide we were talking about further up here. Um, and it freezes at 5.9, which indicates that it has covalent characteristics, so low boiling, low melting point. The change in the oxidation state of manganese is responsible for that change in bonding that could possibly happen. Uh, in general, here's a key thing to note, folks. In general, as the oxidation state, or you can think of as the charge, for example, manganese 7 versus a, a smaller number, uh, if it increases, so does the degree of covalent bonding. When the oxidation state of the metal is highly positive, so a rule of thumb here is plus 4 or larger, we could expect significant covalency in the bonds in the in it forms with non-metals. Thus metals in high oxidation state we find molecular substances such as Mn207 that 7 there indicates that we're using manganese 7 
or here in polyatomic ions such as MnO4 